Truth Espresso, episode 138. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hello, this is Daniel Minnick, your host for Truth Espresso, coming at you with another episode. And I have a very special guest for this episode. Reasons to Believe contacted me and wanted to know if I would like to have Dr. Hugh Ross as a guest on Truth Espresso. And so naturally, I said yes. And so let me introduce you to Dr. Hugh Ross. If you haven't heard of Dr. Hugh Ross, you've probably been living under a moon rock. <laughs> Dr. Hugh Ross is the founder and president of Reasons to Believe, a Christian apologetics organization founded in 1986 and dedicated to showing the harmony of science and the Bible. Dr. Hugh Ross is an, uh, an astrophysicist which basically means that he keeps his head in the clouds and his job is so spacey that it frequently makes him see stars. <laughs> um, Dr. Ross holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of British Columbia and an MS and a PhD in Astronomy from the University of Toronto. He also spent five years of postdoctoral research work at Caltech studying quasars and galaxies. Dr. Ross has written at least 18 books, I believe. The latest include Weathering Climate Change, A Fresh Approach, Always Be Ready, A Call to Adventurous Faith, and Improbable Planet, How Earth Became Humanity's Home. And perhaps his most popular book is The Creator and the Cosmos, which was originally published in 1993, now with its fourth edition in 2018. Dr. Ross is an international speaker and is presented at hundreds of university campuses, as well as at conferences and at churches around the world. And now it is my pleasure to talk with astrophysicist, pastor, and all-around nice guy, Dr. Hugh Ross. Hugh, welcome to Truth Espresso. Oh, thank you for that incredible introduction. <laughs> did I did I get it all right? Did I miss something? Did I botch anything up with that uh, introduction? I know there could have been a lot more, but <laughs> a little bit exaggerated. Better than that, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> now, I I know our listeners aren't here for me; they're here for you, Doctor Ross. And with someone like you, Hugh, I really could just shut up and put this episode on autopilot and listen to you from here on out. But you know, you can't have an interview without some interaction. So I believe a few questions will help with that. And so, you know, here's my first question for you. Now, uh, Hugh, you weren't raised a Christian. Is that right? No, um, <laughs> so, in fact, you didn't become a Christian until your late 20s, I believe. Is that I true? I became a Christian at age 19, but in terms of being able to actually meet a, a oh, Christian, yes. uh, that took a lot longer. I really didn't get to meet a serious Christian until I showed up at Caltech at age 27. Oh, okay, cool. So off a little bit on that there, but um, so you became a Christian because of, in your pursuit of science and studying world religions, could you share your testimony of uh, how you became a Christian? Sure. Well, I mean, I became serious about studying astronomy and physics when I was seven years of age. I was reading four or five books on physics and astronomy a week. And now when I got to age 16, I realized that the universe must have a beginning. And if the universe has a beginning, there must be a cosmic beginner. So that's when I began to search for that cosmic beginner. And not being raised in a Christian home or knowing any Christians, I didn't really know where to start. I started with the writings of the great philosophers, especially Immanuel Kant and René Descartes but discovered they had the wrong concepts of space and time. And uh, that's when I began to look into the world's holy books, 
beginning with the Hindu Vedas. I looked at the Quran, uh, looked at the Buddhist commentaries. But finally, I did pick up a Bible. And I'd been given a Bible in my public school thanks to the Gideons. So I began to go through that Gideon Bible and I recognized that unlike the other holy books of the religions of the world, all of its science was accurate. And moreover, it was predicting future scientific discoveries thousands of years ahead of the time of when it was written. And I realized, you know, if that's consistent, this book must be from the one that created the universe. So I spent 18 months studying the Bible, an average of a little more than an hour a day, and finally came to the conclusion, yes, there are things in this book I don't understand, but everything I do understand is accurate. Uh, this book is free of any provable errors or contradictions. And I found over 100 places where it accurately predicted future scientific discoveries. So that's what motivated me to sign my name in the back of that Gideon Bible, committing my life to Jesus Christ. And immediately I began to look for ways to share my newfound faith. And uh, being raised in Canada, that took me a while to meet Christians. And as I mentioned, it wasn't until I got to Caltech that I finally met someone who was a serious believer, and he helped me find a church that actually believed that the Bible was the inspired and error word of God. Amen. That's a wonderful Christian testimony. And there's there's uh, Christians at Caltech, huh? <laughs> That's... A lot of Christians at Caltech. I mean, I've spoken at over 300 university campuses, and what I've discovered is you're most likely to find uh, believers in Jesus Christ at the highest academic uh, reputable uh, campuses. It's places like MIT, Caltech, Harvard, Berkeley, that you're more likely to find believers than, say, at a junior college. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm sure the battle there is strong because they're some of these uh, places are bastions of you know, propaganda too, as well as finding Christians there. It's pretty cool that you, know, you find Christians at academic places like that. So Hugh, I've heard you mention in several interviews that evidence for a personal creator has been exploding in recent years. Can you elaborate on some of this and give some examples? No, I certainly can. And it's based on a biblical principle that you see in Job and Psalms, that the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we'll find for the supernatural handiwork of God. And the 21st century is where scientific knowledge is exponentially exploding. I mean, in some scientific disciplines, the knowledge base doubles every four or five years. And so one of the features of the organization I founded, Reasons to Believe, is that, that we publish uh, on a daily basis uh, you know, new discoveries that give us more evidence for the creator God of the Bible. Personally, I produce a weekly blog every Monday called Today's New Reason to Believe. And I have to select from the thousands of papers that are being published, which ones I'm going to describe for lay people. But basically demonstrating that indeed, the more we learn, uh, the more we find. And probably the one that blew me away the most over the past few months was a paper that was published making the point that uh, you know, the moon was formed as a result of two planets colliding with one another, a proto-Earth and a planet that astronomers have named Thea. And so we now have a larger rocky planet, and we got this moon. However, after the formation event, the moon was very close to the Earth. And because of that collision, both of them had a hot core. And so there was liquid iron in the core of both the moon and the earth, and because of how close they were to one another, their tidal forces circulated that liquid iron in the core of the earth, as well as the core of the moon, leading to a coupled magnetosphere. And what really uh, got me as an astrophysicist, if it wasn't for that strong coupled magnetosphere, the powerful particle radiation and solar wind, when the sun was really young, uh, would have sputtered away the entirety of Earth's atmosphere and Earth's liquid water, and there'd be no life on planet Earth today. Uh, now, today we don't need the moon to be so close because the sun uh, has subsided significantly 
and its wind and particle radiation, literally by a factor of 100,000 times. Uh, however, uh, when the Earth-Moon system was young, it was crucial that we have that coupled magnetosphere. Bottom line, there's going to be no life anywhere else in the universe that will be conceivable unless you have a moon-planet system identical to the Earth-Moon system with the identical formation history, uh, the identical origin. And the probability of that happening by chance is just utterly remote. And that's just one of hundreds of fine-tuned features we've been able to measure in the past few decades of our solar system that makes advanced life possible here on planet Earth. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. And, you know, and you mentioned the Earth-Moon system there. Like, isn't, and if the moon were closer now than, I mean, closer to Earth than it is now, like, I mean, I'm not an astrophysicist, but would couldn't it possibly cause like tides high enough to, you know, drown out the life we have here on Earth? So like... You would definitely get much higher tides. Uh, you'd also get a much slower rotation rate. Hmm. I mean, because the tidal forces of the moon are slowing down our rotation rate. And that's something else. The rate at which the moon's been spiraling away from the Earth has been fine-tuned to give us a 24-hour rotation rate at the same time that the sun enters its most stable luminosity phase. So it's no accident that God created us at the time that he did in the history of the solar system. He put us here at the perfect time of when we had a 24-hour rotation rate, which is optimal for human civilization. And at the moment, that narrow time window in which the sun has a luminosity stability and lack of flaring activity that makes human civilization possible. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. You know, it's interesting. The Word of God says that the, as the moon is a light, uh, it's uh, one of the lights uh, to give light on the earth. But the moon does so much more than that. You know, it seems for life on the earth too. Um, well, there's over twenty features of the moon that must be fine tuned uh, to make advanced life possible here on Earth. And you talk about the light of the moon. The light of the moon has an optimal nighttime illumination to mm -hmm. benefit the large animals on planet Earth. I wrote an article on that just a few months ago. That's up on our reasons.org website. <laughs> and if uh, people go there, they'll find all kinds of articles about the incredible design of the moon that makes our life as possible as it is. <laughs> wow, that's cool. And that's just the moon. I know that you... Just the moon. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I know. I could write about the asteroid belts and the comet belts. I mean, we have five asteroid and comet belts orbiting uh, our sun. And we're actually finding asteroid and comet belts around other stars, but they're nothing like ours. They're either a thousand times bigger or they don't have any asteroids or comets at all. We live around the only star that has a comet and asteroid belts that permits the existence of advanced light. Well, pretty amazing stuff there and shows how, how great our God is. And um, so I want to get into origins here. I listened to your debate with uh, British chemist, Dr. Peter Atkins on the unbelievable radio show. And, <laughs> and so Dr. Atkins claimed that science proves that the universe literally came from nothing and is actually still literally nothing. And we should not have a problem with the universe coming from nothing with no creator because of the I believe it's the zero energy universe hypothesis. So, uh, so Hugh, why is this not a valid explanation for the existence of the universe? <laughs> well, it's nothing in the sense that you've got an energy balance. Mm. I mean, I'll give you an analogy. It'd be like you having $20,000 in your bank account, but you also have a $20,000 loan that needs to be paid off. Notice that both the loan and your bank account are not nothing. Mm -hmm. But if you add them up, they add up to zero dollars. And so it's the same thing with the universe. If we look at its kinetic energy, its potential energy, its other forms of energy. If you add it all up, it comes to zero energy. But notice all the components are real. Mm -hmm. So it's not <laughs> like the universe is nothing or that it came from nothing. Uh, in fact, in that debate, I talked about the space-time theorems. 
and how these theorems, and what I found incredible, he didn't seem to be aware of them, and yet they were invented by British astrophysicists. Uh, but they actually prove that if the universe contains mass, and all of us are living proof that the universe does indeed contain mass, mm. and if the movements of bodies in the universe are governed by the equations of general relativity, which we can now prove to 16 places of the decimal, then space and time have a beginning. Space and time are created, which implies there must be a causal agent beyond space and time who created our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Well, and yeah, so you mentioned the laws that govern the universe. Could those laws themselves have created the universe? <laughs> or could those laws be the cause of the universe by, over which they govern without a creator? Well, those laws are descriptive of the universe. Yeah. I mean, mathematics is not a, a physical entity, but it describes the operations of physical entity. Same thing with the physical laws. So the law of gravity doesn't have any creative power but it does have the power to describe and predict what's going to be happening uh, within our universe. And when I talk about the beginning of space and time, the universe actually begins only with space-time. But as space-time curvature is released, because the universe starts off infinitesimally small, which means you have extreme space curvature, but as the universe expands, that space curvature is released, and first, it leads to the production of photons. So you get light in the universe, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the cosmic creation event. And then somewhere around uh, 100 billionth of a second, you start getting massive particles. And so after that, you've got a universe of space, time, matter, and energy. But it actually begins with just space and time which definitely points to the idea that energy matter can't exist without a creator. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, that proves a deism that there must be some kind of causal agent behind the universe. And when you read the latest books by people who identify themselves as atheists, they're basically conceding deism. They say, yeah, there has to be a causal agent beyond space and time. The real theological battle is this causal agent a personal being? And that's where the fine-tuning comes into play. When we look at the immensity of the fine-tuning, and I've written now half a dozen books on the fine-tuning of the universe. In fact, I've got a new one coming out in a few months called Design to the Core, and basically makes the point, hey, the one that created the universe has enormous more intellect, knowledge, creativity, and power and care than we human beings. That we actually put a number on it. Uh, the causal agent at a minimum must be 10 to the 99 times more intelligent and knowledgeable than we human beings. And I use that number just to make the point, this isn't any kind of God. It's specifically the creator God of the Bible. Uh, that's what's unique about the creator God of the Bible is so intimately he is involved uh, with his creation. Oh, yeah, it's, it's amazing to think about it. And you mentioned the, the fine tuning of the universe. And that kind of leads into the next question I was going to ask. So, you know, you talked about how the, the universe shows fine tuning. And so I'm going to get into another atheist argument against uh, the existence of God pertaining to this fine tuning. So, Atheists argue, some atheists have argued that the possibility of a multiverse explains away the fine tuning and the infinitesimally small probability of such an apparent fine tuning happening by chance. So, why is a multiverse not a good explanation for how our universe can appear to be fine tuned without a personal creator? Well, back in the 1980s, when I first began speaking about this fine-tuning, I predicted that eventually the evidence for fine-tuning would become so enormous, atheists would have nowhere else to go but to propose that there's an infinite number of universes, where they're all different from one another, where we just happen by pure chance to live in the one lucky universe where everything is just right. Uh, but interestingly... 
an atheist theoretical physicist, Leonard Susskind, has basically appealed to his fellow atheists and said, we have to stop using the multiverse argument. It explains everything. And a theory that explains everything explains nothing. Now, we just dropped it right there. But what I've put in my book, the fourth edition of The Crater and the Cosmos, is an analogy that makes a point. If you've got an infinite number of universes, where every universe is different from every other universe, you're going to have an infinite number of planets, just like planet Earth. And you're going to have trees on those planets. But you're going to have an infinite variety of birch tree species. And birch trees peel white pieces of bark. And if you've got an infinite variety of birch tree species, one of those species will peel thin pieces of white bark uh, that are rectangular and measure eight and a half by 11 inches. And these pieces of bark will, will fall on soil with random chemicals in them. And those random chemicals will put marks on those pieces of rectangular uh, birch bark. And with an infinite number of universes, you would expect uh, that by pure chance, you're going to duplicate all the research papers published by every scientist. And therefore, you conclude all these research papers, including all their diagrams, figures, and equations, did not come from the minds of these scientists. The multiverse did it. And so the same argument you're using to explain away God's fine-tuning in intellectual involvement explains away all the fine-tuning and designs that we human beings have achieved. So it's a self-defeating argument. And mm -hmm. we really do seriously need to look at the fine-tuning evidence. And I've been debating atheists making a point. Notice that the fine-tuning is greater for human beings than it is for bacteria. And notice it's greater uh, for the purpose of the universe being designed to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings from their evil in a short period of time. And so mm -hmm. when you actually combine the fine-tuning design uh, with the purpose, there I think you get a powerful argument, not just for the existence of God, but the personality of God and the purposes and the reasons why this God created the universe. And in my next book, Beyond the Cause, or pardon me, Design to the Core, I'm making the point that no matter where you look at the universe, no matter how big the size scale or the, uh, the how tiny the size scale is, whether you're looking at the large scale structure of the universe, the super galaxy structure, or all the way down to the fundamental particles in the atom, at each point, we see overwhelming uh, evidence that it's all been designed to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings. Wow. And this, I think, is compatible, as you see in the Bible, where it says God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything at all, which would imply that we would expect to see uh, the signature of redemption in the design features of the universe. Mm. Wow, yeah, <laughs> that is that's pretty amazing to show that the fine tuning of the universe, you know, like leads to the idea of the redemption of billions of human beings and and the the multiverse argument, you know, because I've I've also thought of the I've heard of the example of the chances with uh, monkeys typing randomly on uh, on a computer. And so, yeah, the same argument with the multiverse, you can explain away the idea of monkeys pressing keys at random literally producing the book war and peace and you know it's and it's translation into every language in the universe you know For like sure, <laughs> they don't fall on that argument you're assuming that there's a memory device hmm. that every time the monkey makes a correct guess that guess is stored in the appropriate place in a memory device if there's no memory device you can have the monkeys typing for infinity and nothing's ever going to come out of it that has any meaning. It only works if you've got a mind that knows the correct answer mm -hmm. and it has the capability of saving the correct answer every time the monkey happens to hit the right key. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool stuff there. So um, why not? Wh what's wrong with evolution? Like, so you know, given enough time, 
Uh, can't humans have evolved from ape-like ancestors or, uh, and ultimately from simple singular cell organisms? Like, so why, you know, with this, uh, you know, if the universe is, uh, sorry, is it 18 or 20 billion years old? 13.8 billion 13, years old. Okay, 13.8 billion. So for atheistic evolutionists, like, so, you know, if they get the time they agree with the time there why why don't you agree with them regarding evolution and the evolu- macro evolution the evolution of humanity from an ape-like ancestor or single-celled organisms is there anything special like where the bible proves that humans or the science proves what the bible claims that humans are a special creation and they didn't evolve like um, atheistic scientists would claim? Well, we have a staff biochemist, uh, Fazal Rana, and uh, he's been writing books on the origin of life and the history of life. I've joined him in a couple of those projects. We also have a scholar community of about 150 research scientists at uh, different universities that work with us as volunteers. And uh, what we've been pointing out is, you know, Yes, there are reactions that go on outside of living systems uh, that do produce uh, simple amino acids, that do produce uh, nucleotides, but there's also chemical reactions that are destroying them. In order to get things right, you have to have the uh, constructive chemical uh, reactions uh, outweighing the negative ones. And uh, we don't see that. I mean... uh, I've been on record as saying eventually we'll find our ribose sugars and the nucleotides and amino acids uh, in dense molecular clouds because we know that's the one place where they got to be constructed. And uh, so, so far we haven't found them, uh, but that's because the destructive chemical reactions are operating at almost the same rate as the constructive ones. On the other hand, we do know those reactions work in those interstellar molecular clouds. So I think if we actually look uh, with sufficiently sophisticated equipment, we will find those simple building block molecules at roughly one part per billion. And uh, I think this prediction is going to come true soon because we now have the telescope power to detect these molecules at one part per billion. So far, nothing has happened. But I think in the next few years, we're going to see these discoveries. However, it's of no benefit to any naturalistic origin of life model, because if you've got abundances at a part per billion or less, there's no way uh, that's going to help any origin of life a model. And, uh, you know, we had reasons to believe regularly attend origin of life research conferences, and they're different from all other science conferences we attend. Typically, when you go to a science research conference, Uh, the auditorium is crackling with excitement about the new discoveries and how we're finally solving problems. But when you go to an origin of life research conference, each successive conference is more depressing than the previous ones because they're recognizing, wow, we thought we had problems last year. Now we got even more problems. The challenge is even more difficult. On the other hand, I am excited about what they've done in the lab. I mean, they're pulling off amazing accomplishments and trying to understand the chemistry, the origin of life in the lab. But it takes a a team of brilliant biochemists with a lot of money and a lot of technology and making sure they're only working with pure chemicals where there's no contamination and no disturbance to get the results. And even then, they're not able to produce a protein. I mean, the best they can do is put together a few amino acids into a chain of 40 or 50 amino acids, Mm -hmm. and then they get stuck. Uh, And the whole point is, it simply demonstrates someone with a lot more knowledge and intelligence and technology and funding must have created life in the (laughs) first place. Yeah, God, and God doesn't even have to go $30 trillion in debt to make it happen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so uh what has been your like when you've interacted with atheists like what has been the most challenging argument 
you have faced from atheists against uh, your testable creation model? Well, I'll tell you what they think is the most challenging. And it's different with every debate. Hmm. Uh, but typically, uh, they're convinced that the statements of the Bible contradict what we scientists are discovering. And so typically, in any of these debates, I'm frequently having to explain to them uh, the biblical text. And I run into a lot of these atheist scientists who've heard what the Bible says, but they've not actually looked at it for themselves. And so making the point, hey, yes, you need to take the creation text in the Bible literally, but also consistently. And I'm finding a lot of them simply aren't aware of the breadth of content on creation and science in the Bible, and how when you look at it literally and consistently, it basically answers their objections. A lot of them are coming up with straw man arguments. They'll say, well, everybody knows that the Bible tells us that the universe is only 6,000 years old. And I says, well, where did you get that from? You know, when I read the Bible as a 18 year old, I recognized right away these creation days must be consecutive long periods of time. There's no evening and morning for the seventh day. Their Bible texts that tell us we're still in the seventh day. It's the day when God stops creating. And I said, notice, we see no evidence for new phyla, uh, new orders or classes in the human era, but we see it all over the place before the human era. For six days, God creates. On the seventh day, he stops creating. And so just, and I think that's wonderful, just getting people exposed to what the Bible really teaches about creation resolves a lot of these issues. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the science, uh, I've seen nothing in the science uh, that would dissuade me uh, from a Christian perspective. I mean, you were mentioning a debate uh, with Peter Atkins. Mm -hmm. I would tell people, hey, watch that debate. You can watch it for free on YouTube. And uh, what you notice is the moderator of the debate challenged me. He says, Hugh, are there scientific discoveries that would cause you to abandon your Christian faith and become an atheist? And I volunteered several. Yeah, if you were to prove that the universe didn't have a beginning, that would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. If you could prove that we human beings are just like all the other animals on planet Earth, that there's nothing exceptional about us, that would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. And yet when Peter Atkins had his turn, he couldn't volunteer anything uh, that could be discovered in science that would persuade him to abandon his atheism and believe in God. I mean, the only thing he came up with, he says, well, I suppose if God appeared to me right in this room <laughs> and started talking to me, uh, maybe. But then he said, no, I would be convinced that I was having a delusional uh, vision. And I would discount that. So the bottom line is it showed that he was unwilling uh, to ever allow science uh, to test his presuppositions. Whereas the Bible tells us, test everything, hold fast to that which is good. So on a daily basis, I put my Christian faith to the test. And yes, there are anomalies that don't quite fit. But what I've noticed over the decades the anomalies that look like they don't fit with the Christian faith, if you study them sufficiently, they get resolved. And they do reveal more anomalies. That's how science works. Every time you study anomaly, it exposes more anomalies. But if the new anomalies are smaller and uh, less problematic than the ones you resolved, that's a strong indication you're on the pathway to truth. And consistently, that's what I've seen with the scientific challenges over the past five decades, that uh, these things do get resolved and the resolution leads to more issues and problems, but they're at a much lower level of uh, being problematic. And so I think that's how we test our belief systems. I mean, you've got the God of the gaps, you've got the no God of the gaps. Mm. It's what happens to the gaps when we research them. If the gaps get smaller and less problematic, you're on the pathway to truth. But like with the origin of life, what we see at origin of life conferences, from a naturalistic perspective, the gaps are getting bigger and more problematic and more numerous. That should tell you you got the wrong model for the origin of life. 
Yeah. The, the Atkins debate you mentioned, uh, you know, as soon as I heard it, yeah, that were you, the example that you gave about his, uh, yeah, it, it sounded to me like the God of the gaps, like the, it reminded me of that, like, wait a minute, isn't this like kind of the reverse of the God of the gaps there? And yeah, and then with, okay, well, there really is no proof, you know, because there's no evidence that he would accept because he can't even trust his own senses to tell him the truth, which, you know, technically could be true in a naturalistic atheistic universe how could you know for certain that your senses actually do tell you the truth unless there is a creator that gives meaning to the senses that you really can observe and see truth there <laughs> so. i remember one time i was speaking at the international skeptic society conference there were 700 atheists from around the world attending that conference i said i think i've just seen a new proof for god today what I've been observing is all of your speakers have been focusing on the God of the Bible. They have, they've been basically giving the other gods a free pass. They're only focused on the God of the Bible, and they're passionate about his non-existence. And likewise, I see that in all of you in the audience. And it says, if you were really convinced that there was no God, you'd be treating the God of the Bible like you do the Tooth Fairy uh, or Santa Claus. And the fact that you don't tells me you really do believe in this God, but you don't like him. And the answer I got uh, yeah. from the atheists was very revealing. They said, it's not that we hate the God of the Bible. It's that we despise his followers. <laughs> and then they began to share with me all the really bad encounters they had with people that identified themselves as Christians. Mm. So I think that's why the Bible so strongly exhorts us. Mm. Love your enemies and they show charity and respect and gentleness to all. Yes, amen. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've seen those bumper stickers that say, Lord, you know, God, protect me. Jesus, protect me from your followers. You know, it, 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 as, as much as that, seeing sometimes that makes me want to cringe a little bit. I do have to reflect and think, am I showing Jesus correctly? You know, <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, um, so a quick little question, because I know that uh, you have, you know, all this astrophysics knowledge, and then, and then actually, I know, I'm going to get into a, a young earth question. <laughs> but one question I'd like to know is, what's on the other side of a black hole? <laughs> and would something sucked in the middle literally get frozen in time? <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, that uh, as you approach a body of infinite density, it slows down the passage of time. And yeah, at the center of the black hole, you have a singularity uh, where you've got infinite density. So technically, time would stop uh, when you hit that singularity. And if you ever saw that uh, you know, movie, uh, oh, it's a recent movie, Interstellar? Interstellar, okay. yeah. <laughs> and uh, what I liked about that movie is, in spite of it uh, being fanciful, <laughs> all the equations they showed were correct. Mm. So uh, I was excited about that. Yeah. Uh, but it actually showed this guy going into the singularity of black hole and time stopping. Now, the reason why that was fanciful, as you approach a black hole, uh, the gravity will stretch out your body into about a three mile long line mm. of uh, particles. Spaghettification. <laughs> the black hole, the particles get destroyed. Mm. So there's going to be no possibility of you existing yeah. at the center of a black hole. Uh, but the concept is correct. If you've got infinite mass density, uh, time actually slows down and can even stop. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool and bizarre to think about. Uh, uh, black holes, it's almost like you know, when I read about them, I kind of get this little, like, a little bit scared. Of course, I know I'm not going to get sucked into one, but like, just trying to conceptualize that it's like, bizarre to, to just to think about. And so well, I actually wrote an article and it got published in a peer reviewed secular journal on black holes. Mm. And it's about how God's care is revealed in black holes. Mm. So and by the way, it's public access, anybody can access it. Oh, cool. I'm going to have to check that out to feed my... Well, uh... <laughs> make the point 
We need yeah. black holes to have life in the universe. Oh yeah, <laughs> another one of those fine tuning arguments. It's another yeah. fine tuning yeah. argument. That's so, pretty uh, cool. And we happen to live in the best possible place in the universe in terms of the distribution of black holes. <laughs> yeah. So I know um, time's kind of fleeting here, but I I know I want to mention I know that in the Christian realm you know, we have, there are different, uh, ideas of creation and, you know, different understandings of the age of the earth. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, I hang around, I, you know, kind of like, you know, I would consider myself young earth, but ignorant, you know, I I'm not in any way an expert on this. And a lot of the, the podcasters in the community that hang around are young earth, but, so I, as I was listening to some of, uh, you know, like some of uh, your discussions and debates, and I just have this uh, curious question, I'd like to see how, see your answer to this. Uh, I was listening to a, a discussion that you had with uh, Dr. Jason Lyle on the, the show Realized Apologetics last year, and you had an exchange with him over his theory about distant starlight and what he calls the anisotropic synchrony convention or ASC right. Right. Uh, for the one way speed of light. And you mentioned gravitational lensing of light from a supernova that I believe was observed in 2014. And, and uh, there's a comparison with the year later there. So Dr. Lyle mentioned that, he had refuted that argument that the gravitational lensing of light from the supernova disproved um, ASC in an article he had recently posted before your discussion with him. And you, you said you would try to read his article. Have you had a chance to read it and, and see what it's yeah, about? I, or? Yeah. And uh, what I realized is that uh, I was presuming that Jason Lyle was claiming uh, that the Earth was a favored position in the universe, mm. where the velocity of light is infinite towards the Earth and half the velocity away from the Earth. But having read his paper, what I'm really realizing he's saying is it doesn't matter where you are, that mm. the velocity of light is infinite towards all observers, regardless of their position, and regardless whether it's an instrument or a human observer. So, for example, you could have the James Webb Space Telescope a million miles away from the Earth. And he says that qualifies as an observer. And so his model is basically ad hoc. He's basically Mm -hmm. saying it doesn't matter where you are in the universe, if you're detecting light coming towards you by an instrument or a human observer, it's infinite, and it's half the velocity of light in every direction away. And as you notice in that debate I had with him, he identified himself as a presuppositionalist. Mm. And actually, it'd be correct to say he's a hyper-presuppositionalist. He's basically developed a model that cannot possibly be tested by any means of observation or scientific investigation. And so it's an anti-evidentialist model. Mm. Now, that's one way to protect his young Earth uh, position, but it's going to be impossible to ever convince anyone of a young earth perspective, and it's against what I see the Bible teaching. The Bible tells us, test everything, hold fast to that which is good, which is basically making the point, our beliefs are testable. A problem I have with Jason Lyle, he set up a model that can't possibly be tested. It's basically Gnosticism. That's what the Gnostics believed. And I made that point before in my books, And one of the fundamental problems with young earth creationism is that it's Gnostic theology. It's basically saying, we know what's going on. Everybody else has no idea uh, what's going on. And, uh, you know, it's that the real world is not able to give us reliable information. And, of course, he's not the only young earth creationist that says that. I've run into lots of them that say, we can't trust the book of nature. Nature can't be trusted. It's corrupted. It can't give us reliable information. Only the Bible can give us reliable information. The problem I have with that, the Bible itself tells us that the record of nature is a truthful, trustworthy revelation from God. So 
I'm actually writing now a book on dual revelation because I'm realizing it's not just young earth creationists, theistic evolutionists, atheists, deists. Uh, we have conservative uh, seminary professors all attacking the doctrine of dual revelation, basically saying, hey, uh, we can only trust uh, the Bible and the Bible reveals nothing about science. A very common perspective today to say that the entire Bible is silent on science and creation. But hey, it was a science and creation in the Bible that brought me to the Christian faith. And I think one of the things we have to worry about as Christians, the Bible seems to have an evangelistic hermeneutic that were to use the Bible and the book of nature to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. And if you abandon the doctrine of dual revelation, you basically have lost your tools to persuade people outside the church, outside the Christian community, to consider a relationship with Jesus Christ. So taking a missiology or an evangelistic hermeneutic to the Bible, I think actually gives us a more reliable interpretation of what the Bible is really communicating. And I do the same thing with the record of nature. I think that's the best way to interpret science. Okay, cool. Definitely some food for thought there. And now we're kind of getting um, low on time. We're about out of time here. So, uh, Dr. Ross, you, do you have anything that you would like to leave for uh, our listeners? And how would they get in touch with you? Well, they can get in touch with me through reasons.org. You'll find thousands, literally tens of thousands of podcasts and articles and books there that you can access, most of it for free. Uh, they can get free chapters of any of the 20 books I've written by going to reasons.org slash Ross. I also have a Facebook and Twitter page where I take questions from people. So if people want to ask me questions, they can do that through that means. And uh, also they can go to our website and they'll see answers that we've provided to hundreds of questions that people have asked us in the past. So reasons.org and reasons.org. Uh, slash Ross. And one of the books I've written, you mentioned, Always Be Ready. Mm. I make the point in that book, if you will prepare as a Christian good reasons for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ and are prepared to share those reasons with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience, you will see God supernaturally bringing people to you that in advance he is prepared to hear and respond to your good reasons. It'll be just like what you read in the book of Acts. And the first two or three times it happens to you, you might think it's a coincidence. But when it happens hundreds of times, that will persuade you. God, through his Holy Spirit, is supernaturally intervening to assist me in my ministry. And I know of nothing else. You know, I'm also a pastor. Mm. I know of nothing else that will strengthen the faith of believers than seeing the Holy Spirit performing those kinds of Book of Acts miracles in their life. So my exhortation is, join the mission. God commands everybody to be part of the mission. Join it and watch what he does for you. Amen there. Um, so yes, definitely check out reasons.org, um, Dr. Hugh Ross's organization website there, and definitely go to reasons.org forward slash Ross. I know I did, and I am going to be reading my free chapters of your books, Dr. Ross. And so I would like to thank you for um, graciously uh, being my guest here on Truth Espresso. I surely enjoyed uh, the conversation. There's And you have <laughs> a lot of information to give, a lot of good stuff, a lot of uh, good things to... Um, challenge atheists and, and show the marvelous uh, work of God in creation. And so thank you, Dr. Ross, for being here. You're very welcome. It's been my pleasure. All right. That will do it for this episode of Truth Espresso. Stay tuned for uh, future episodes of Truth Espresso. I know my wife and I have um, eventually we got to finish up our uh, series on marriage. And I know we've got to work on making our episode on divorce, you know, and it's kind of hard to do, but uh, yeah, we're going to give our 
uh, episode on divorce. And then I've got some things coming up with um, a series on Jehovah's Witnesses in the work. So stay tuned for that. And God bless you. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso. 